Hey guys, Adam here with yet another video for you today and what I hope would be the start of a new series that for lack of a better title I'm just calling Ask Adam. And in this uh, series I'm going to basically just go over my weekly email questions from you guys. I get tons of questions throughout the week. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, uh, Clav, OneCircuit.com, tons of questions. Unfortunately I don't have time to answer them all. Uh, but the few that I do uh, respond to, I figure why not just uh, you know record that and put that out as content. Um, lots of times the, the answers that I get from uh, from you guys um, are repetitive, right? You guys have a lot of similar questions. You guys are facing the similar problems with your repairs. And so I figure why not just record the answer and that way it'll help uh, a lot of you guys out with uh, the various projects that you're working on. So we'll see how it goes. This will be the first in the series. Um, and I'll just I'll take a look at some schematics, maybe describe some stuff to you on the whiteboard here and uh, we'll see how it goes. All right, so this first question is from Lemonhead. This is a question on my YouTube video on my six player X-Men repair. Um, Adam, I have the same board you wouldn't happen to know would be causing a coin mech input. Coin mech input? I think it means coin, the coin switch for Colossus to be stuck on. Colossus is my favorite character. Good choice. Uh, what you wouldn't happen to know what would be, I'm sorry, I totally <laughs> lost my train of thought here. Uh, I have the same board. You wouldn't happen to know would be causing the coin mech input for Colossus to be stuck on. I got all excited when he mentioned Colossus. Uh, it shows this even when the micro switch is connected. When the mic, when no micro switch is connected. Sorry. All right. So it sounds like what you're saying is that um, it's just always registering, right? I get this question a lot, actually. Um, people have um, controls, you know, the joystick is always moving left or the buttons are always on or something like that. And so why don't we go over um, how these inputs work, right? Because they're pretty much the same for every arcade game out there. Let me grab my marker. And so the way this works is that for every input, it could be a button, it could be a joystick, it could be a coin switch. You basically have a switch, right? So let's draw a little picture for a switch here, which looks like this. All right, that's a schematic symbol typically for a switch, or you might have something that looks like, you know, this with a little T on the top for a push button. Um, but I'm from more familiar with the, the one on the bottom here, so we'll stick with that. Uh, and on one end is grounded, so we'll draw a little ground signal here. And then the other end goes to uh, a pull-up resistor. So we'll have our 5 volts up here and our resistor. And then on this end, you've got a capacitor which is also hooked up to ground, okay? And then it goes into a buffer. And usually it's a, what's called a tri-state buffer. And a tri-state buffer is kind of interesting in that it has this enable signal, okay? We'll just call it enable for now. And the way this works is that if uh, if we want, we can turn this guy off. And when I, when I say turn it off, I mean literally like it, like it, you disconnect it as if it's not even hooked up to whatever this wire is, okay? And the reason that they have those is that, um, you know, this, this here allows whatever's on this end, in this case, it's actually the CPU. You've probably got a, a large bus here. Uh, actually, can I use my bigger marker for that? There we go, let's use this for this. So we got this big wide bus here, with lots of bits. And this is usually, sent over to the CPU. So the CPU is reading this, your Z80 or 6502, whatever CPU you have on your game. And it's reading this, okay? It's reading all the inputs from your from your controls. Or, let's say uh, it doesn't want to read that, it can read something else, like maybe your dip switch settings, right? So over here, you have the, um, you know, the same thing. You have a little, I'm just gonna draw a quick little mini version of what I just drew. And this is another switch, and this happens to be part of your dip switch, right? And so the way this works is that while your program is running, the game program, it's doing things like, um, you know, display high score, move the player, um, check inputs, right? Check this stuff. Uh, and then it goes in, in a loop, you know, redisplay high score, you know, move the player, check inputs, da, da, da. And as it's doing that, it's playing with these enable signals, okay? So we'll call this enable one and enable two. So when it reads the uh, the player's uh, buttons, right, it's... it's um, it's enabling this guy here, it's asserting enable one. And then maybe when it's um, reading the dip switches, uh, it asserts enable two. And so these guys won't be on at the same time, but it'll cycle through and enable these different things so that it can read this information. Hopefully that's clear. And so anyway, um, there's not too much that can go wrong. If you look at, at this little schematic here, there's like uh, three, three things. There's a pull-up resistor, there's a uh, capacitor, and then this little buffer here. 
Um, so what happens, right? When you when you when you turn the game on, what's what's going on from a from a schematic perspective? Well, this thing is not even connected, so we don't have to look at this for now. You're you're not pushing the button. You're not coining up your game. So what happens? Well, you have five volts here, right? And so current's flowing down, and it charges up this capacitor until it gets to five volts, and then that's it, right? Um, in TTL speak, 5 volts is considered a logical one, right? So if we talk about uh, digital logic or binary or whatever, um, this is a one. And then when the CPU wants to read from it, that one passes through and it pops up on the other side. So you read the one, okay, nothing's being selected, right? In this case, when you push a button or you, um, I'm sorry, when you move your joystick or push a button or insert a coin, what the CPU is looking for is a zero, right? You're grounding the signal. So anytime it sees a zero, it's like, ah, okay, this guy just moved his joystick, or he just pushed a button, or put in a quarter, or whatever. So one means nothing's happening. Um, so what you're seeing is that this is always a zero, okay? So look at this schematic. What, what would cause that? Chances are it's this guy right here, this capacitor, right? If this thing is shorted to ground, then it doesn't matter if you push it or not. It's just always being forced to a zero. And whenever the CPU is reading this, it's always getting a zero on the other side. So I've seen this many, many times, actually. Um, and chances are that's that's your issue. Now, where is that on the schematic? I don't know. Let's, let's pop open the schematic. Let's see if we can find it. All right. So we have our six-player schematics. And I just found this, of course, on the web. And let's see if we can find uh, our inputs. So um, got some color stuff. That doesn't look like inputs. Ah, here we go. So control for player one, player two. And if we scroll down, we have what else? Ah, here we go. Uh, player three, four, five, and six. So who is Colossus? Let's go to the control panel. Colossus is uh, player two. So we know we're looking for uh, player two, which I think uh, is right here, control for player two, and actually right here. So it's, it's part of the JAMA harness, actually. It's not part of these uh, other um, additional connectors that they have specific for the six-player version. So you can see here coin one and two. Coin two is the guy we're looking for. Looks like pin T on the JAMA harness. So if we scroll down here, let's see if we can find out and again, we're looking for something like I drew there, a uh, capacitor, uh, buffer. Um, I do see some start stuff. I don't think that's it. Let's keep poking around here. That's it? Schematics? Okay, we must have missed something. Let me go back. Um, let's see what we have. Probably just blew right past it. And nothing here. Okay, those are we already saw. Maybe oh, maybe it's above. Maybe it's above this here in the schematic. Sometimes things aren't in order. Uh, let's see. Nope. 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 Uh, that's video. Ah, aha! Here we go. So we have. Um, one player up and down, left and right, shoot. Ah, right here, right here. You can see it. Two player coin, uh, T, right? Pin T. Aha. So um, this game doesn't have the discrete uh, capacitor and resistor combination like I drew. This has a custom, and it's the 005273 Konami custom, which inside, I believe, has that pull up resistor and the capacitor. And you can see it's got VCC and ground, and that's probably what they're used for. They tie into that. So. Um, if I had to guess, I would say this is probably the, the problem. And what you can do is uh, take a logic probe if you have one, or even a voltmeter should work, right? And a check pin, what is it? Uh, check pin 8 on this guy right here. It's 15B on the board, so hopefully you can identify that. Check pin 8. If you check with your voltmeter or logic probe, you should see that it's 0 volts or the light is off or whatever you know, logic probe you have. It's grounded. And then check the other side, right? Because this is just basically just passes right through. There's no enable or anything going on with this part. Check pin 7. If pin 7 is also low, then you know it's probably a problem with this guy right here. Um, if not, then I guess it could be this one here. But I would, I would say it's probably this guy right here. This is 005273. Now, that's a Konami Custom. Where are you going to find another one of those? You're probably going to have to pull it off of a 
another bad Konami PCB. Maybe you can find a parts PCB on eBay that's been, you know, all the proms have been ripped off or whatever and use it as a parts board. That would be my next bet. So anyway, Lemonhead, hopefully that helps. This is the guy that I would uh, suspect is the issue. All right, this next question is actually from an email. Uh, so I'm looking at this screen from Kevin Chase. No, Kevin Case. Kevin Case. Hey, Adam, I was wondering if you could tell me where you purchased your DK and DK Junior horizontal and vertical pots for the two-stack boards. I've seen that Bob Roberts had them, but he's not taking orders right now. So I was wondering if you had an alternative source for them. Thank you, Kevin Case. Yes, I do. So actually, um, I get them from Mauser. I get all my, my uh, components from Mauser. You can use DigiKey or whatever, but um, I've had good luck with Mauser. So the ones you're looking for right now, and I don't know how to pronounce it, if it's Piher or Piher, P-I-H-E-R. This is the pot in question that I use. Let me make sure you can see that. Um, and it comes with a little, well, it doesn't come out. You have to buy this separately, but it's a little, uh, what do you call it, a little knob. And that's what it looks like. So let me show you where you can get that. Um, it is part of their PT15 series, and so you can see here, this is the data sheet for the Peher, Peher, we'll just call it Peher, Peher um, PT15 series uh, pots. And so this is very intimidating if you look at it, um, so let's go through it a little bit. So how to order, right? So this kind of gives you a little guide on how to order. What do all these little things mean? Well, if you scroll down, you know, you've got rotor selection, you've got how you want to mount this thing to your PCB, um, and other various features, horizontal mount, vertical mount. So let's kind of go, go up to the top and we'll see what we need here. So uh, PT series, PT15, uh, rotor, what rotor do we want? Well, if we scroll down here to rotors, um, basically you can get them with these little arrows, you can get them with the little, little hole that we have, so you can click in a, a knob, that's what we want. And then you can get even fancier, like when they ship it to you, where is where is this thing going to be uh, positioned? Is it already rotated to the left or to the right? I guess that saves time uh, manufacturing. If you know that you want it to be in the center, or if you want it to the left or the right, you can have them do that prior to shipping. We don't care about that. And so right here, N, it says removable shaft or thumb wheel. That's what we want. We want a removable shaft. So N is the one we're looking for. So PT15N, okay? Now, uh, mounting method. The mounting method that works really well is this mounting method down here, uh, B. So you can see B, well actually let's take a look at H or, or HC or whatever, um, HC5 here. It's got straight pins, right? But B, they'll put a little kink into it. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see if you can see that. Uh, probably not, but you can kind of see it, I guess. You've got these little kinks in the pins here, and what it allows you to do is you push this into your PCB, and you'll hear a little click, and then it'll stay there while you're soldering. So you don't have to worry about having to hold it with one hand and solder. You just snap it in there. It'll stay there. You can solder it, and you're good to go. So B is, is the mounting method we want. So if your mounting method is B, then the code is H06. So what are we up to so far? PT15N. H06, the value, very important, 50K, right? And they give you a little code here. So uh, 101 is 100, 223 is 22K. So it looks like the first two values is the, you know, the resistance, and then the last is like 10 to the whatever, right? So uh, 10 times 10 to the one, or 10 times 10 is 100 ohms. 22 times 10 to the third is 22K. So we want 50K, so we want 50 times 10 to the third, 50 or 503. Um, so that goes into there. Taper, linear, log, or a log. I'm not sure what a log. Uh, linear or logarithmic. We want a linear taper. It just means that when you're at one end, it's zero, and it just gradually linearly increases in resistance all the way up to 50K as you get to the other end. It doesn't do one of these sweeping logarithmic curves. It's just a linear curve. That's fine. Tolerance, 2020 tolerance is fine. So what does that mean? It means that our part number is PT15NH06503A2020. Uh, so let's go to Mauser and let's see if we can uh, type that in here. PT15, of course I already forgot what, PT15N, so on and so forth. Actually I have it written over my shoulder here. Uh, H06-503A2020. Uh, Let's see what we have. There we go. So, 
This is the part here, PTNH06, uh, 54 cents. There you go. And so this does not come with the shaft, right? And so if you go back to the top here, uh, where are we? Go back to the top. It'll talk about, why does my recording software do that? It's frustrating. But anyway, uh, if you go down to the bottom here, you'll see shafts, right? And so we need a shaft. Uh, I think the cheapest way to go is a hollow shaft. And you probably want it to be stick out somewhat like this. I think this is a 19 millimeter shaft. And so it looks like 5214 is the shaft you want. So if you go back to Mauser and we type in, uh, let's say, uh, what did I say it was? 50, I'm sorry, uh, 5214. 5214. Maybe even put in their shaft. We'll see what it finds. P I H E R 5214 shaft. It should find something. There we go. We have a solid shaft, cream color, or a hollow shaft. And you can see the hollow shaft is actually cheaper. Uh, actually, that's a different part number. Uh, here we go. This is it right here. 13 cents. This is the guy you want. 5231. 5214CR, and that is the shaft. So you'll buy both of those separately. You know, it's under a buck a piece, so that's not too bad. And then you'll end up with the exact same pots that I use. So hopefully that helped. Okay, our next question is from Dathan Walters on YouTube. And his question is, what are the horizontal counters and vertical counters used for and do what? Can you please explain more in detail? Sure. So the horizontal and vertical counters um, give you a frame of reference. So let's go to our whiteboard here. And every single game, um, with the exception of maybe some really old games, um, have horizontal, horizontal and vertical counters. And the way it works is if we kind of draw our fictional screen here. This is our arcade monitor. All right. And <clears throat> let's say that it is... Um, I don't know, 244 pixels high by 256 wide. So this is a ver uh, horizontal monitor. The counters let us know where the beam is at any point in time on the screen. Okay. Now, we don't have direct control over the beam uh, on a raster monitor like we do in a vector monitor. vector monitor, you can actually uh, indicate exactly where you want the beam to be in any position on the screen through the X and Y signals and all that business. You don't have that luxury in a, in a raster monitor, but you can indicate to the raster monitor when you want to start drawing another horizontal line or when you want it to start drawing an entire frame, okay? That's what those sync signals are for, horizontal and vertical syncs, and I'll see if I can explain that. So the way this works is <clears throat> you have your beam that starts in this corner here, right? And it's moving its way across the screen. And as it's uh, moving across the screen, the game is incrementing this counter, this horizontal counter. So it starts at zero, and it's going one, two, three, four, five, and it's just counting as it's working, the, as the beam is working its way over here. And when the counter reaches 255, okay, one less than this, it'll send a, well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna simplify this, okay? Um, when it reaches this maximum count, it sends a horizontal sync to the monitor to say, hey, look, I'm done drawing this line. Can you reset the beam for me? and the monitor will uh, turn off the beam, it'll bring it all the way back over here, and it'll start on the next horizontal line, okay? And when it does that, the game logic will increment its vertical counter to say, okay, now I'm on the next vertical line. So the vertical count goes from zero to 243. Again, in this example, different games have different resolutions, and so these counters have different values. But you can see the idea, right? So I start over here at position zero, zero, and I work my way over to the end of this line, when the counter reaches 255, I send a horizontal sync signal to the monitor. Um, the monitor will then um, turn off the beam, set, go over to the next uh, vertical line, and then it'll start over again. <clears throat> so you can see what this kind of is. Like if, if you've done uh, geometry or whatever in, in uh, even elementary school, this is like a Cartesian coordinate system, right? This is location 0, 0. And this is location 0, 1 and 0, 2 and so on and so forth. This is, you know, 10, 10, 100, 100. And over here in this corner is uh, 2, what is it, 255, 243, right? So why is this useful? It's useful because all of the graphics logic, all of the graphics logic 
on your video PCBs use this information, the horizontal and the vertical counters, to let them know where the beam is, okay? For example, if you have something on the top here that says high score, okay, we need to know when to start drawing that. And so in memory somewhere is located the position for this letter H, okay? And this letter H maybe should start being printed when you're, uh, I don't know, location one, um, 72, for example, okay? Which means, I'm sorry, that's that's opposite. It should be 72, one. Let me reset my little board here. In other words, I want to start drawing when um, a location 72 uh, horizontally and then one down, right? And so the logic is constantly monitoring these two values, these two counters. And when it sees that, yes, I've reached that counter, it sends a cue stupid thing keeps moving, sends a cue to the logic to say, all right, go ahead and start drawing this letter H, okay? Um, now, these are kind of static, and, and usually we call these characters, um, or you call them tiles, depending on the, the, the vernacular that you're using. Um, but what, what's really interesting is that you can have um, things that are, that are moving in space, right? Like uh, sprites and things like that. So say Pac-Man, for example, let's say he will draw him down here, right? He's going to have some register or some logic on your game board that's going to be changing, right? As you're moving the controls up and down, left and right, the horizontal, and those are usually called horizontal and vertical position counters, okay? Those are incrementing and decrementing based on how you're playing with the joystick and moving him around. And But it's the same concept, right? You have some logic that's looking at the horizontal and vertical position counters for your character, and then it's comparing them to the horizontal and, and vertical counters, the overall counters that let you know where the beam is. And when those are equal, it starts counting the character, okay? So hopefully that, that kind of clarifies things. Um, if you look at just about any schematic, you'll see they're called like H count or V count, or maybe you'll see the actual individual bits broken up, H1, H2, H4, H8, because they're always in powers of two. Same thing, V1, V2, V4, V8. Um, those are the horizontal and vertical um, counters. So hopefully that'll give you a little heads up on how that all works. I am going to, and I know I keep saying this, I am going to do an extensive video on video um, logic, like I did with the um, uh, CPU PCB logic. Again, it's just finding the time to do that, but hopefully this is a little nugget to kind of get you interested in this kind of stuff. And I'll, uh, I'll cover that more in the uh, next video. Okay, next question here is from Matt uh, Janzik. He says, Adam, I've watched your videos and appearances on John's Arcade over the years. You do great work and are amazing at troubleshooting logic problems. Well, thank you. Uh, I've been learning a lot over the past several months, and I'm trying to assemble a test bench so I can work on games without being hunched over the cabinet. Good plan. What do you use in your lab for your video CRT, sound output, and game I.O.? Uh, coin, start, joystick. Uh, in other words, your whole test rig. I bought an analog scope with XY mode for vector games and I'm looking around for a logic comparator to get me going. I do have a Fluke 9010A, but no pods. They are so expensive. Yes, they are. They're very expensive. I actually got my entire Fluke set up, the uh, 9010A, with Z80, 6502, and 8080 pods back. This is way over 10 years ago for, I think, $400 for everything in one big box with the probe, with the Fluke probe, which I don't really use that often, but um, it's still sought after. Um, so yeah, they're crazy expensive now. Um, da -da -da. Uh, so the comparator will do me well in the meantime. Would there be anything else ideally needed to troubleshoot mostly pre jammer era logic boards? Thanks for all the advice. So um, to do, you, you can get you can go a long way with a logic probe. And, and if you've looked at my videos on how to troubleshoot digital logic uh, with a logic probe, it covers a lot of the basics. Really the key is just diving into um, the, the TTL data book and getting an understanding of what the logic gates do. And then you can really go a long way uh, with a logic probe. Now, that being said, yes, there's plenty of times where I just can't figure, you know, I, I, I test all the chips, whatever, they all seem to be wiggling, they seem to be alive, but it's not enough to tell me whether they're, they're doing what they should be doing from a system level perspective. Is the CPU able to access all the read, ROM and RAM and all that business? For that, yes, you kind of do need a fluke. So you're off to a great start. Um, I would say logic probe, the fluke, and then maybe uh, a logic analyzer. And you don't need to go crazy with a very expensive logic analyzer, just something basic that has, you know, maybe I wouldn't go for one that only has, say, eight channels, maybe something that's got 16 channels. That way you can kind of check out, you know, a data bus and then maybe some control lines for a, a prom, I'm sorry, a ROM or a RAM or something like that. 
Um, so yeah, those are your the, those are the, the the key elements. I would say logic analyzer, the fluke, obviously it's kind of expensive, and you you can get away without it. You just really need to know the the system and, and how it all works, and a logic probe and, and that that whole thing. Why don't we take a a walk over to the bench and I can show you what I have. I I'm not very impressed or, or pleased, I should say, with my setup. Um, it was really just a means to kind of very quickly get get uh, testing going on some boards, and I just haven't had our time to change it. But why don't we walk over there and, and we can take a look at that basically my setup. All right, so here is the, this I guess is the right side of the bench. This is the side where I do 99%, uh, if not all my repairs actually. Actually, all my repairs I do on this side. Experimenting with uh, uh, the pole position clone, and we'll see that in a second, is on the other side. But this is where I do all my repairs. It really is set up as a two, two bench or two station bench. Um, but because of issues with syncing Mario to that monitor, I'm sorry, Mario, Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. to that monitor, I've had to bring down an, uh, a Sanyo EZ and use that for, um, for all my Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. debug. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so yeah, this is really supposed to be set up for two stations. You can see the two lights here, but I just kind of have, have grown and used it in one big station, which seems to actually work out pretty well. So anyway, yes, I do have the fluke here, and then I use that from time to time. As far as, you know, you mentioned I.O., I don't know if you follow my videos, I have nothing set up for that at all. Um, the only way that I can coin up the game and move the character back and forth is by knowing what chips are receiving those signals from the joystick and, and probe, grounding them manually. So you'll see sometimes they'll say, all right, I'll use my cheater method, and I have a, a, a probe that's tied to ground, and I'll actually, you know, short out one of the pins, and it'll actually make the Mario move left and right, up and down, and coin up the game. That is a total, you know, uh, hacker's way to do it. I do not recommend doing that. And I have every intention to create uh, what essentially is called a super gun, right? So a super gun is a box that's got a power supply and, and it's got all buttons on it or maybe a joystick a plug and um, and allows you to control the games and everything in a more elegant way. And so that that's my intent. Probably have a box situated under here or to the side that um, it just has a JAMA harness that comes down, plugs into here. And then up here I can say, okay, I want to coin up the game. I want to press one player or two player start. And then I can actually, actually I have it right here. Um, I was going to just use this old, this is an old Gravis joystick I had, a PC joystick from back in the day. But it's got lots of buttons on it and it's got a D-pad. And so my plan was to basically have a little plug in front of the uh, super gun that I could plug in the joystick. And then that way I can coin it up and then just test basic functions, move Mario around, make him jump, make sure all that works. Um, I have none of that. You can see here, all I really have is a JAMA edge connector here. Right, This is, matches the JAMA standard. And I have three things. I have power, I have video going out, and I have audio going out. And that's it. Again, it was just a means to power up the board, um, work through the issues, make sure that the sound is working, the video is working, everything, and then and then send it back to the customer. Because 99.9 .9 of the problems is that the game doesn't boot or the graphics are screwed up. There's no sound. Nothing about controls. And so that's been my MO for, for many, many years. Not that it that, that Not that it should be your way of doing things, right? Try to look at this and, and improve upon it by all means. So anyway, I have my, my Gemma uh, power supply here, feeds into this connector. I have my video out that goes into this thing here, which again, I want to clean up. And this goes up to my uh, Commodore, I apologize, the light's not working today, uh, Commodore uh, 1080S monitor. And so this syncs very, very nicely to uh, a huge range of arcade games. And so I've had this forever and it's uh, worked very, very well. Um, there are a few other ones. Just Commodore makes quite a few monitors that will work. Uh, I'm sure you can Google it with the arcade, with you know arcade syncs. Uh, Apple also makes quite a few, and so do your research. You don't, you don't obviously need that. You could get away with having a, just a standard arcade monitor, maybe a 13 inch if you're crammed for space. Throw it on your test bench and have the signals running to your JAMA harness, and you'd be all set. But this is just happens to be what I have. The other reason why I like this is because. This here, the 1080S, has, uh, I think believe it stands for stereo. It's got stereo audio coming out of here, and so I can take my audio signal right here and feed that right into the monitor. And so, you know, I don't have to have to worry about separate uh, audio amp or any of that business. Everything's all captured in here, and it works very nicely. So that's my setup. Again, I do not recommend that you stop here. By all means, go forward and add uh, I.O. control and all that kind of business, and and, uh, and you'll have a much cleaner setup than this. I do, I don't know if this is worth mentioning, but I do have this on both sides. I really like this, actually. So this is just, it's, you know, controllable, whatever you want to call it, power center or whatever. They, these are big back in, like, the 80s and 90s. You know, you can see here, oh, my printer, my monitor, my computer. Um, this is just, from, you know, back from the days of old. 
but I have one of these hooked up to my Sanyo uh, monitor. I have another one hooked up to the power supply to the board itself. And then I have one hooked up to this monitor. Um, I like to kind of, sometimes what I'll do is I'll fire them both up and then if I want to change something here real quick, rather than power this whole monitor down because it takes a little while for it to kind of warm up, I want to see the effects right away, If let's say if this game is booting or something. Um, so I'll leave the monitor on, I'll turn this game off, and then just turn it right back on and I can see the results up here on the monitor. So anyway, let's take a walk over to um, the uh, other side of the bench here. And again, this is a two-station bench. It was supposed to be a two-station bench. I guess it is. This is, this is the uh, monitor that I'm working on for my main build. But here is the other um, side here where I do, where I did, I guess I haven't touched this in quite a while because I figured out all the customs, but this is where I was working on uh, pole position two, uh, or one or two, I guess. Uh, the, all the customs reverse engineering was all done on this side. Now you'll notice that I don't have um, the video going up to this monitor. This is just a standard 13 inch color monitor. And here's the power thing like I had on the other side. And so uh, I've had this monitor for years also, and I didn't want to go and try to find another Commodore and have to deal with that. And so I just bought a simple, you know, RGB to, what do you call this, RCA converter. I think this is actually a J-Rock converter. It is a J-Rock from 2002. Look at that. And so what's nice about this is you can use any monitor, right? Any, any little monitor or big monitor, whatever you want. Any TV, I should say, right? Any TV, you can use that as your test bench monitor. And so these are not that hard to find. I'm sure there's other variants out there, not just the J-Rock. Uh, but you can see I just have the same deal, right? Power going in, video and audio, which of course is not being used right now, coming out. Because that's all I really cared about. I'm not going to play this. I just wanted to get it working, or not working, but I wanted it to come alive and be able to see the video and, uh, and the audio while I'm you know, reverse engineering this thing. So it served its purpose, but again, if I wanted to uh, you know, debug a game in, in more detail and play around with the I.O. and stuff, I don't have that capability, so, so that would be something to add. So anyway, hopefully that answers your question. That's kind of my setup over here, um, and I've been using that for many, many, many years. Okay, next question here is from, actually this just came in this morning, from Biomech011 over on Clav, Charles looks like. Adam, I know you are a busy man. I apologize, but I have hit a wall. Uh, I am still new at this. I have lost the ability to coin up on my super punch out. Uh, okay, so here we go. This is just like what we, we talked about a, a few questions ago about coining up your game. I had bought the Vector Labs dual PC punch out switcher and it has failed me. Not a good system. I do not recommend it. I can't speak to it. I, I've never seen or used it before. So I decided to just leave the game has a dedicated super punch out. Well, the jammer switcher fried my coin up. Uh, okay, so I think you mean coin up ability, not not like my coin up or anything, my coin up device. Uh, I can only play by pressing the test or service button. The board does not read the coin switch. I never, I've never fiddled with the coin mechs uh, at all, so I know there's nothing wrong with them. They used to work fine like a champ before the switcher. Is this a simple ROM repair or does it go deeper? This is the only arcade that I have that doesn't coin up in a game room of tokens got any advice can you help any feedback is most appreciated charles yeah so this is just like we talked about right so this is very common where either the coin or the button or joystick or whatever uh the it's always being registered or it's never being registered right and so there's only three three components in that little configuration right there's the capacitor there's the resistor and then there's the buffer cases like this where it's not receiving any signal at all it's always the buffer I was going to say almost always, but it's always the buffer. I've never seen a case where the resistor pull up the pull up resistor has failed, and it's not the cap because then it would it would always be registered. It's never being registered. It's always the buffer. So let's take a look at the punch out schematics. I can bring them up here, and uh, let's see if we can see what we see. Uh, okay, good. So here is the um, punch out schematics. This is the CPU PCB. And can I zoom in on this? I should be able to zoom in on this. Let me zoom way in here. That's probably too much. That's nah, not bad. All right, so let me uh, scroll down. This is the Z80. And if you go all the way down, here we go. So you'll see these are all of your player inputs, right? And they all have these little pull-up resistors like we mentioned. And this game in particular doesn't have the capacitors. That's okay. You know, some, some people decide not to put that in there. Um, actually, can I? Yeah, okay. And you'll see the 1R and the 2R, 
those are the buffers. And you can see over here, right? This is a, this is a good example. So this is exactly what I mentioned before. Uh, here's your dip switches, right? And they have their own buffers. So these little signals here are the enables. And so when the CPU wants to read the joysticks and the buttons, it'll enable these guys. When it wants to read the dip switches, it'll enable these guys. And they all get tied to the same bus, this DD bus that goes all the way to the Z80. Anyway, you're saying you can't coin up the game. Well, here is coin a one and two. They pass through a resistor and they feed into uh, this guy right here. It's an LS240, which is a tri statable buffer, and it's located at 2R. So if I had to place my bet, I would say that's the guy that is uh, having the problem. So replace that guy, uh, and then hopefully you'll get all your uh, coin ability back. Okay, and so last question is, can you guess? Yes, it's what's the status of pole position, right? This is this is the number one question that I get asked across all forms of social media, CLAV, uh, you name it. At least once a day, somebody's asking me, what's the status of pole position? So uh, I don't know if you follow my thread over on CLAV, but uh, the pole position clone prototype has been laid out, and uh, I need to go ahead and um, confirm it against the schematics, make sure everything matches, make sure everything is as it should be, and then we should start seeing some hardware soon, I hope. Um, and that'll give me uh, the ability to go ahead and um, go through my design in detail, make sure everything works fine. Um, probably hand it over to John to do um, some testing over at the hangar. We've had some discussions about that because he already has a, a pole position game over there. So it'd be nice to put it in an environment where it's going to get beat on um, and just see, you know, see how it does. So that's the plan. You know, no, no final dates. I know people asking, when can I buy this thing? There's still, you know, no, no date set in stone as far as when we'll have production uh, stuff ready. Uh, but we're we're getting there. I mean, we're making progress, and so hopefully that's good news for for those of you who are waiting for this well anticipated product. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this first. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it an episode of Ask Adam, but but we'll see how it goes. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed that. Did you enjoy it? Let me know in the comments below if this is something that you guys want to see me answering your questions for for everyone else to to hear or see or whatever. Um, so yeah, actually, if you guys want to ask questions that for me to answer here, and again, I can't guarantee anything. I can't guarantee that I will have time to answer your question. I, I cannot guarantee that my answer will solve your problem. Um, but if it's something that you want me to take a look at in anticipation that maybe I could answer it uh, on the show here, then uh, go ahead and send it to askadam at onecircuit.com. And by the time this video airs, I'll make sure that that's a legit email address. Um, but yeah, ask Adam at uh, onecircuit.com, and then that way I can have a one place to kind of look for questions. Of course, if you ask a question below on YouTube or Club or whatever, um, it'll probably show up on my radar, and I'll, I'll take a look. But maybe this way, by having one centralized email, it'll make it easier for me, hopefully. So anyways, that's going to do it, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, send me questions, and uh, God bless, and we'll catch you on the next one. Hey guys, Adam here with yet another video for you today. And what is this saying? Oh, is this okay? Continue recording without audio. Stop recording. Microphone currently is in use. It's in use. Recording, recording. How does, how does John do it? Something like that? Hey guys, Adam here with yet another video for you today. And in this video, we're gonna start a new series. Why does this keep doing this? No, it's fine. Don't warn me if there's no audio, just record it. So I guess that's it. <laughs> uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Did you enjoy it? Let me know. Uh, didn't you enjoy it?